man, it's good to be here. Uh, I love Advent. Anyone else love Advent? No? Yeah, a handful of you. Uh, it's been a huge tradition when I was growing up. Uh, the Advent wreath, the different candles, week after week, we would have, uh, my mom would just like hang this, she'd make it and have little gifts for every single day leading up to the 24th uh, on our staircase. And for us as kids, we absolutely loved it. And so uh, a couple years ago when we got to start Cross and Crown Church, I was like, I want this to be a part of our tradition. And so ever since, we have been celebrating Advent as a church. And so uh, that's my gift to you. You're welcome. Uh, just trying to be here for you. And so the second week of Advent we just heard is love. But the four weeks, uh, there's different ideas, different uh, themes that essentially lead the church through to that. But Advent means arrival. And so what we do in these four Sundays leading up to Christmas, we anticipate and we celebrate the arrival of Jesus, knowing that he has come once and that he is coming again to rule and to reign and to judge and to restore all things. And so for me personally, for our family, every time we kind of get to celebrate Advent, it is a reminder that King Jesus is on the throne and he is coming back for his people. So the four Sundays in Advent, the first one is hope, because our hope is in Jesus. The second one is love, because God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The third one is faith, for without faith it is impossible to please God. And then the fourth one, this year, we kind of changed it a little bit. Usually we've done sharing. Uh, this year we're doing peace. Because the peace of God has come in Jesus Christ, and that peace is the message of the gospel that we get to share with the world, that they too can be at peace with their great God and King, Jesus Christ. And so uh, today, uh, I have to fulfill a promise that Emerson made you guys last week. It's interesting. He's like, do we as a church preach through the genealogy? It's like, that sounds crazy, but we're going to do it. And then he promptly didn't do it. <laughs> what is that all about? I, I just, I'm just saying, like, he reads like two verses, verse 1 and verse 17. He's like, oh, preach through the genealogy. No, he didn't. Uh-uh. Not last time I checked. So today I'm going to keep the promise that Emerson has made you. I'm going to preach through the genealogy. All right, so would you stand with me as we read uh, the phone book? No. This is going to be a little bit of what it feels like. It's a little bit weird, all right? Now, the reason we stand is because we believe this is the Word of God. And so as we read the Word of God, we give it honor and reverence. And so thank you so much for standing with me. Uh, but here's what we believe at Cross and Crown. This is the Word of God. And all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable. Amen? Amen. All right, here we go. All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable. And my prayer for us is that by the time we get done with this section, we will have found it profitable for our souls. Let me read Matthew chapter 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. And Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram. And Ram, the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon. And Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahab, the father of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. 
And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abiad, and Abiad the father of Eliakim. And Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim. And Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations, from Abraham to David, were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Let me pray. Father, thank you that your word indeed is God-breathed and it is profitable. I pray that you would make it so today. Holy Spirit, empower me to speak in a way that's helpful and truthful and makes much of King Jesus. And Holy Spirit, let our hearts and our minds be receptive and respond in faith to what you have for us this morning. Pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. You guys may be seated. All right. So genealogy. What's a genealogy? Well, a genealogy is ultimately a line of descendants traced from an ancestor. Uh, but it's actually potentially more than that. Now, in, in Israel's days, what we would have is we would have genealogies that would prove that this piece of land was yours, and it was going to be yours to pass on to your descendants. It was hugely important in regard to property rights. See, for Israel, part of the promise of God had always been the land. And so Israelites were very particular about a genealogy. Now, uh, it had to do with who could serve as a priest. And so the genealogies were really important. Who could serve in the royal line as a king? And so genealogies were really important. King Herod, who remembers King Herod, big evil dude who killed a bunch of babies. That guy actually hated it so much that his genealogy did not trace back to the Jewish kings of, of the, the great empire of Israel, but to the Edomites. And so King Herod actually went and had all the genealogies he could find destroyed because he was jealous of those who truly traced their ancestry to the kings of Israel. And so this line right here uh, is tracing the royal line of Jesus through Joseph. It's interesting, Luke 3 also has a genealogy. And in Luke 3, the genealogies vary, right? Really from Abraham to David, they're the same. And then it changes. One traces the ancestry through Solomon and the other through Nathan. All right, interesting. Uh, both uh, by Bathsheba. All right, we'll get back to her in just a moment. And so what do we have? Well, we have two, uh, two lines. One is the biological line of Jesus through his mother Mary. And then the other is the right to rule, the royal line that comes through his adopted father, Joseph. That's really, really important. So that's why we have two different genealogies. Uh, it's interesting for the Jews, this would have been hugely important because one of the facets of Messiah was that he had to come in the line of David. If he didn't come in the line of David, now there were other, there were other regulations, other requirements, but if he didn't come in the line of David, immediately he would be out. Could this guy be the Messiah? Well, nope, not in the line of David. He's out. All right, so... This, interesting enough, is never something that the Pharisees and the scribes who hated Jesus brought up. They never questioned his ancestry and his royal line. And so they questioned all kinds of other things. They're like, where did you come from? Who are you? Who gives you the right to speak like that? Who gives you authority to teach like that? Why in the world can you forgive sins? You're not God, right? There's all kinds of other things. But in terms of he is a descendant of David, that was never 
in question. And so Matthew starts his thing right here with this genealogy. Now the genealogy is, is incredible and there's probably a bunch of different things we could talk about. We could talk about the sovereignty of God in overriding uh, human sin, right? Human folly. The sovereignty of God in putting together and protecting the ancestry of the Messiah. Those are things we could talk about. We could talk about the incarnation, that God himself would become a human being to dwell among us, or as the Gospel of John says, to tabernacle among his people. We could talk about that, but I think what I want to talk about, particularly because it's Second Advent, is the, the great love and the great faithfulness of God that is displayed in the genealogy of Jesus and that ultimately comes to each one of us through Jesus, all right? So that's my goal for this morning, to take a look at this genealogy. Uh, yes, it is proof for an authentic, qualified Messiah. Yes, it traces his ancestry in the royal line. Yes, it gives him authority to rule and reign. However, it does so much more. See, when Matthew starts here, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, he does two things. One, he doesn't just say genealogy. The word can mean source, beginning, genealogy, lineage, but it can also mean the story, the life story, right? It's more than just lineage. And I think when Matthew writes the book of the genealogy, what he has in mind is not just this first 17 verses. What he has in mind is there's a story of the king who came. There's a story of God who condescended and became human to save and to love his own. And so when Matthew says this is the, the book of the story of Jesus, I think what he says is this is the book, this is the, the story of the new creation that comes, is inaugurated through Jesus Christ. Uh, now in this, he gives Jesus multiple titles. All right? He says he is uh, Jesus, he is Christ, he is the son of David and he is the son of Abraham. And we're going to actually kind of explore what does all this mean. But I promised we would look at it through the lens, if you will, of covenant love. Second Advent, it's love. For God so loved the world that he gave. And so love in the scriptures always is this has said covenant love of God, all right? Uh, we, I use the, the English version of the word hesed. Uh, in, when you look at a lexicon, it would say chesed with C-H-E, the little, little uh, accent, and then E-D, all right? Chesed, that would be the word. And, and what it means is it means loyal love, and loyal love has to do with a love that is generous, a love that is enduring, a love that is a commitment that will never cease, no matter what. It's a covenant love that ultimately points to the fact that it is God's love that is not conditional on our qualification. It's not conditional on our worth. It's not conditional on our value. It's not conditional on our faithfulness. But it is conditional only on the character of God. And that's really, really good news. Right? Throughout the scriptures, we see this covenant love expressed again and again. Let me give you a couple examples. All right, Exodus 34 says this. And this is, the story goes that Moses wanted to see who God was. And so God then passed before him, and this is what he says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. It is a faithful love. It is an enduring love. It is a loyal love that God has for his people. Undeserving as though as they might be. All right, so that's the, the first one. 
Now, this covenant love traces its way through the story of Israel, right? If you go into the Old Testament, you see it's the story of Abraham, right? And for Abraham, there is the, he's a pagan idol worshiper. Uh, yes, he becomes the father of the faithful. Yes, he becomes the ancestor of the Jewish nation through Isaac and Jacob and Jacob's sons and then into the, the story of the Exodus. Absolutely. But Abraham, as Emerson mentioned last week, starts out an idol worshiper, starts out a full-on pagan. And everyone is like, why him? Exactly. Why me? Why you? The sovereignty of God, the loyal covenant love of God, is the only explanation. And it's mind-blowing. It's surprising. And so we have Abraham, who is, by the way, even after he starts following God, right before he starts following God, he is an, a pagan idol worshiper. After he starts, because sometimes we tell that story, right? Oh, I used to be this, and now I'm perfect. Abraham used to be a pagan idol worshiper, but then, oh, perfect. No, 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 no. He is a liar. He is an adulterer. And he gave away his wife to save his own hide more than once. By the way, one time is one time too many. He does it twice. All right? So Abraham has an issue. And yet God is saying, and he makes this covenant with Abraham where he says, I will bless you. I will give you a son. I will give you the land upon which you are sojourning as a stranger right now. I will give you, I will make many nations from you. And in you, in your seed, in the one that is to come, all the nations of the world will be blessed. That is the story of Abraham. And then you have Jacob, right? Well, we have Isaac first, but forget Isaac for a moment. We have Jacob. Now, if you know anything about see, Isaac is kind of like, he's a pretty good dude, really. Like, I mean, like we're, he's probably traumatized by being sacrificed or almost sacrificed by his daddy. I mean, that, that would traumatize the best of us. Uh, be that as it may, let's skip Isaac for the moment. Jacob. Jacob, that dude is crazy. Again, like he, I mean, it's amazing. He's a treacherous liar. He is conniving, manipulating. He's a trickster. Even his name means supplanter. None of you know what that means, right? He, trickster. He's a trickster. That's his name. Oh, man. And he states in Genesis 32, verse 10, he makes this statement. He says, Oh, God... I am not worthy of all the chesed, of all the loyal, steadfast love that you have given to me. He got it. In the end, our trickster friend Jacob got it. He says, I'm not worthy of this love. And then we have his sons. I mean, his sons are, are a complete mess. If you want to read the story, it's in that latter part of Genesis. Right? They are so angry with their brother, they decide, let's kill him. In a stroke of humanity and kindness, they decide to only sell him off as a slave to Egypt. That's amazing. Right? That's the kind option. It's like, well, we've got two options. We can just kill him. That, that seems like best. Well, let's be kind. Let's be considerate. Let's be loving to our younger brother. And sell him as a slave to Egypt. That's the story. Then they get to Egypt. I mean, it's, it's mind-blowing. And what does God do? Covenant faithfulness. Not because they were so good. Not because they were mighty. Not because they in some way were special. No. The chesed of God. The covenant love and faithfulness that is based on the character of God. Not on the faithfulness of the people on whom he would shower his love. It's amazing. Uh, and then we, we, we go on. And yet, what is true throughout? It is the steadfast love of the Lord. It is the covenant chesed love of the Lord. Psalm 136. I love that psalm. If you've read it before, you're kind of like, it seems repetitive. 
Oh, yeah, it does. Let me just read you a couple of verses. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. And then he tells the story of creation, tells the story of Israel being stuck in Egypt, Israel being led out of Egypt through the wilderness, through the Red Sea, and ultimately every line, 26 times it says, for the steadfast love of God, for his covenant love, for his for his loyal love, for his generous love, for his unconditional love to us, endures forever. Wow, that's the covenant love of God. It's powerful. Now, now this covenant love is ultimately, when, when we read through it, and I have it all outlined in your notes, but what we see is it is the covenant love of God that rescues Israel out of Egypt. It is the covenant love of God that forgives their sin. It's the covenant love of God that is faithful when we are faithless. It is the covenant love of God that pursues us. I love this in Psalm 23, Psalm many of you probably have memorized. God says this, or David says this about God. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You know what goodness and mercy, that's, that term there, is steadfast love. Surely steadfast love is going to follow you. It's going to follow you everywhere you go. Throughout this Advent season, as you're wrapping up whatever you're wrapping up, as you're going into your holidays, as you're going into 2023, the steadfast love of God pursues you. And then in Proverbs 3, 3, it says that we are invited into this love. God says, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. So the chesed love of God is ultimately his covenant love, his loyal love, his steadfast love. And in the genealogy now, we see this love displayed. Let me, let me walk us through this a little bit because I, I actually... I'm pretty excited about this. So let's take a look. The first thing we see in the genealogy is that kind of the opening statement. It is the genealogy of who? Of Jesus. What does Jesus mean? It, it comes from the word Yeshua or Joshua, which means that Yahweh saves or the Lord is my salvation. And so for the first thing that we see in this is that Jesus is a savior, that Jesus is a redeemer, that Jesus is the one who comes to rescue his people from their sins. When we look in verse 21, it says this, uh, the angel is speaking to Joseph, we'll get to that next week, but he says this, Mary is pregnant by the Holy Spirit and she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. Name him Jesus. Why? Because that name is what he will fulfill. That name is what he is going to accomplish for his people. So the first we have is Jesus is Savior. Now, I don't know if you've ever felt like you, you were too broken for God to do anything with you. I don't know if you've ever felt that you were damaged goods. I don't know if you've ever felt like there just was no hope, no way out, no future for you. I would love for us to meet four people that felt very much like that. The four people are the four ladies that find inclusion in the genealogy of Jesus. Genealogies were, were absolutely a thing that everyone did, but the genealogy was always traced through the father. 
the mother was not mentioned. Now Matthew veers from that tradition and he goes and mentions four people in the genealogy that otherwise might not have found inclusion. But it points to the fact that God has loyal love and God is a savior of the broken, of the needy, of the desperate, of the victimized, of those who are longing for hope and a future. Let me show it to you. Right here, it starts with Abraham. We talked about him a little bit. Isaac, we skipped him. Jacob, he was trouble. Judah and his brothers. And the moment we get to Judah, now we get to the story in Genesis 38. And the story in Genesis 38 is a sordid story. And I'll let you guys read this on your own. All right? And the story is about Judah's sons. And as Judah's sons are born... He gets a wife for his sons. Her name is Tamar. So Tamar is the daughter-in-law of Judah. And her first husband is evil and wicked. And God kills him. It actually just says that in the scriptures. And this guy was wicked and God killed him. That should make us take notice. <laughs> it actually doesn't say that much in the scriptures. It's like, <gasps> what now? Yeah, evil. What did he do? Doesn't say. Next guy does say that how, well, how he is being evil, but the next guy, so Judah's next son, is like he is now given to Tamar because there's this thing called levered marriage. And so uh, if your brother was married, didn't leave any kids, you were to marry his wife to raise up ancestry or, or children for him. That had to do with all the different property rights, the family name, etc. This next kid, just as sinful. What does God do? Kills him. You're like, I thought this is an Advent sermon. I know. On the covenant love of God. And so Tamar now is waiting for the third son to grow up. She's living in her, her father-in-law's house. She's waiting, uh, like maybe in her father's house. She's waiting for this kid to grow up so she can marry this kid because this is what is, what is required. This is what's expected. And this kid grows up. And he's a man. And he is in marriageable age. And you know what Judah does not do? He does not give his son to Tamar as a husband. He's like, the first two died. Surely it was her fault. No, it was because they were wicked. Tamar had done nothing. And so Tamar is desperate. And she's like, I'm supposed to have offspring. I'm supposed to have children. I'm supposed to have sons. I'm supposed to be married. I, like, and yet, I've been discarded. I've been pushed aside. I've been condemned to just live as a widow for the rest of my days. I'm despised. I've been discarded. I have been just mistreated. And I'm desperate to come up with a solution. My first husband died because he was wicked. My second husband died because he was wicked. And he would not give me another husband. Now what do I do? And so Tamar comes up with this strategy. She disguises herself, make her look like a prostitute, puts a veil on, and goes and sits at the busiest street corner in Timnah where they're going to she uh, shear their sheep. That's a hard thing. You try to say that, right? Like in a foreign language, no less. So they're going to shear the sheep in Timnah. And so Judah and his buddy go there. And Judah has just lost his wife, so he's kind of like, oh, man, this is a bummer. And he sees this prostitute on the side of the road, and he is like, yeah, let's do that. That sounds awesome. That's in the Bible. See, you guys are like, the Bible is boring. It's because you never read it. <laughs> like, this is, this is incredible, right? So we're, we're looking at Genesis 38. This is the first book, right? I get it if you get, like, stuck in Exodus 25 because it's the same thing as Exodus 22. I get all that, right? But this is the first book of the Bible, chapter 38, and it is crazy. All right, so here she is, and she's like, yeah, I, you, you want to you wanna have sex with me? Sounds good. What are you going to give me? Oh, I'm going to give you a, a little, little kid, a baby goat from the flock. Sounds good. Do you have it with you? No. What are you going to give me? 
Well, I'll give you like my signet ring and my staff and my cord and here you go. And so they do the deed and she ends up pregnant. Now a short time later, someone comes to Judah and says, your daughter-in-law played the prostitute. She's pregnant. He's like, let's burn her. Let's kill her. Well, that seems like a double standard. I don't know. And so as she's being brought out to be executed for being unfaithful, for being adulterous, for being promiscuous, she sends out the staff and the signet to her father-in-law. She says, check this out. I am pregnant by the man who's the owner of these. And he recognized his sin. He recognized that he is way more wicked than she is. And this woman becomes the mother of Zara and Paris, and they are in the lineage of Christ. That's crazy. Now, that's just the first. You want to keep going? Let's keep going. So here, this is Tamar, Genesis 38. The next one is Rahab. And so we, we just had Tamar. This is congratulations. Now we move our way down. Solomon is the father of Boaz by Rahab. Rahab. That sounds familiar. Joshua. And the spies went into Jericho and they took refuge in the house of Rahab, the prostitute. She was busy in the oldest profession that the world has known. She's a prostitute in Jericho. And she says, we have heard of your God, and I believe that your God is going to give you the land. And I'm going to protect you, and I'm going to help you, and I'm going to assist you. I want to be part of this people of God. Wow! She's had a testimony right there. And so when we look at Joshua, what happens actually is that when they take over the city and the city is being sacked and the walls are coming down and everyone is being murdered, the only household that is saved is the household of Rahab, the prostitute. And she becomes part of the covenant community of Israel. And Joshua tells us, and she has lived with us in Israel to this day. Wow. Now, a sinner for sure, but a repentant sinner, a sinner full of faith, a sinner that is saying, God, I, I don't know. I didn't know any better. I was part of these people. I tried to make a, make a living in the only way I knew how, but I see that there's something there that I am longing for. I'm seeing something in these people. I'm seeing something in your interaction with these people. And Rahab the prostitute is being made part of the people of Israel and mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. We keep reading. Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. Oh, that's interesting. Who is Ruth? Well, from all accounts, she seemed pretty righteous. All right, if you read the book of Ruth, this is during the time of the judges. Uh, they are leaving Israel because there's a famine in Israel, and they're going to a neighboring country, the country of Moab. Uh, only problem is Israelites were not supposed to go there. And they were definitely not supposed to intermarry with Moabites. Right? Well, anyway, so this, this Israelite and his wife, they go to Moab. His two sons marry Moabite women. And then the two sons die. And Naomi says, hey, you guys marry someone else. I'm headed back to Bethlehem. And one of the women is uh, Orpah. She's like, yeah, that's fine. I'm out of here. I was just waiting for permission. And the other one is like, no, I'll go with you. And that's Ruth. And Ruth says, your people will be my people. Your country will be my country. And your God will be my God. And so she leaves her land, leaves her family, leaves her people, and goes with Naomi to Israel. And there... The story is beautiful. Uh, she ultimately met, meets and marries Boaz. And Boaz is the father of Obed, who becomes the father of Jesse, of whom is born great King David. 
And so amazingly, both Ruth and uh, Rahab have now become great, great, great grandmothers of David and then by extension of Jesus. It's amazing. Now, now you say, well, Ruth, I mean, she was innocent, right? Yeah, but she was from the tribe, from the nation of Moab. You know where they came from? Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? When the, the cities of the plains were destroyed by God? Lot fled Sodom. His wife becomes a pillar of salt, and his two daughters are hiding out in the mountains thinking that everyone has died. And the two daughters say, hey, I got a plan. We need to somehow repopulate the world because everyone is dead. There's no more human beings. Just, it's just us and our father. And so the two daughters commit to like get him drunk and sleep with their own father. And the Moabites and the Ammonites are the result of that incestuous relationship. No? All right. Keep going. You're like, that's, that's nothing. Fine. Keep going. Now, Jesse, right? Jesse, his great-grandmother is Ruth uh, from Moab. Jesse was the father of David the king. And David, the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. She doesn't even get a name. That's outrageous. What's happened? David, in the spring... The time when kings go out to war was napping on his rooftop. And as he's napping on his rooftop, he sees this beautiful woman who is, is bathing uh, across the way. And he is like, bring her to me. Now, a lot of people say, oh, Bathsheba, adulteress. Really, you're going to say no to the king? It's not like David was like this young, handsome warrior. No, by now, he is old, probably has lost all his teeth. He's fat. He doesn't go to war anymore, right? This isn't like, oh, it's so romantic. No, this dude is old, toothless, and fat. <laughs> She's a victim, people. Like, she's being victimized by David the king who is more wicked than maybe you even thought he was. And David commits adultery. He murders Uriah the Hittite, who was one of his special operations soldiers. And he has a child, and that child dies. And then he marries Bathsheba, and he has another child, Solomon. And so Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, another foreigner, makes the genealogy of Jesus. Now, I read quite a bit this week, and I saw a lot of uh, commentators say, and see, these evil women, they, you know, needed a Savior, and so look, there's Jesus the Savior. Are they sinners? Absolutely. But are they desperate? Are they broken? Are they discarded, rejected, victimized? Yeah. You know what's more miraculous? Is that David makes it into the genealogy. That Ahaz makes it into the genealogy. Kings who worship the Assyrian gods and then practiced human sacrifice. Who killed their own sons as a sacrifice to Molech. Manasseh, of whom the scriptures say that he was more wicked than even the evil nations that God drove out. They make it into the genealogy. Uzziah, who was a good king, and then somehow his hubris, his pride got the better of him. And he said, I'm going to go offer sacrifice in the temple. David, who was a good king, and then his hubris got him to commit adultery and murder. Good kings like Josiah and Hezekiah, evil kings like Manasseh, all make it into the story. Israelites and Moabites, Hittites, 
men, women, foreigners. They make it into the genealogy of Jesus because he's first and foremost a savior. He saves his people from their sins. Yeah, these ladies, man, yeah. There's Tamar, who is desperate, and I'm not condoning her, her strategy. There's Rahab, but yeah, she is a repentant sinner. There's Ruth, who seems godly, but is coming from a line that the Israelites were not supposed to have anything to do with. Bathsheba likely was a Hittite just like her husband was. And what we see is, we see that Jesus is the Savior who has come for those who feel too broken to have any future, to feel too hopeless to see that tomorrow, what tomorrow could hold. And the Savior comes, Jesus to bring his love, bring the Father's love to the people that so desperately needed him. It's interesting that the line from which Jesus came shows us the people for whom Jesus came. Isn't that awesome? I, I absolutely love it. Well, let's keep looking at this. We see uh, these kings. We see these different characters. We see these four women. But see, it's not just Jesus the Savior. It is also Jesus the Christ. Three different groups of people were anointed in the Old Testament. Kings, priests, and prophets. And Jesus fulfills all three roles. As a king, he has come to rule and he has come to defend us against our enemies. And Jesus comes and he defeats our enemies of Satan, sin, and death once and for all. He is the Christ, the anointed one. He comes and he fulfills the role of the priest. What did priests do? Priests, they, they offered prayers to God. They offered sacrifices to God. But they had to offer sacrifices for themselves because they were also sinners. And Jesus comes and he is the perfect mediator, the one mediator between man and God. And he offers prayers to God and he offers his own body, his own blood. A sacrifice for sin. The perfect, once for all, sacrifice. The sinless priest is Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one. Finally, prophets. What did the prophets do? The prophets were responsible for calling the people who were wayward back to the covenant, back to the truth of God's covenant love, of his chesed love. What about Jesus? He is the anointed one. He is the prophet who calls out people to come to him. He is the one who is himself the truth and who is himself the way to the Father. Isn't that awesome? It's amazing. See, Jesus is the one who invites people into relationship with the Father. So it is the genealogy of Jesus, the Christ, the son of David. Now, son of David, uh, in 2 Samuel 7, there is a covenant that God makes with, Sam, uh, with David, and he says that one of your line will always sit on the throne. His kingdom, his rule will have no end. Psalm 2, which is a messianic psalm, actually says that he will rule, the Messiah will rule with a rod of iron and he will rule all the nations, right? That's the promise that is being made to David. And now Jesus comes and he fulfills that. He is the son of David. He is the king in David's line. Now what's interesting is what does that mean for us? What did that mean for the people? give you two examples. Uh, there was the, the two blind men that followed Jesus, right? That here Jesus is coming along. What did they shout out? Son of David, have mercy on me. The king comes. He comes with grace and he comes with mercy. 
He comes to bring healing to his people. What did the Canaanite woman cry out who wanted her child to be healed? Son of David, have mercy on me. Oh, that is amazing. Do you know that Jesus as the son of David is the bringer of mercy? He is the, the king who comes with mercy and healing. There's a, there's a well, this is probably going to show you that I'm a little bit of a nerd, but here we go anyways. Uh, in the, the, the Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, J.R. Tolkien writes this. He says, the hands of the king are the hands of a healer. Man, that's our king. That is Jesus, the son of David, who says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus comes as a savior, as the anointed prophet, priest, and king. He comes as the son of David, and he comes as the son of Abraham. I said earlier that the, the covenant language with Abraham in Genesis 12, 2, and 3 has to do with that all the nations would be blessed in his seed. Uh, the apostle Paul explains what that means. Seed, not as many, but as one. All right? And so then what we see here is this. We see that all the nations will be blessed in Genesis 12 and in Genesis 22. Right? And then we see this. Matthew picks this up in chapter 28. And he says this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations. Jesus is the son of Abraham through whom all the nations would be blessed. That's incredible. And, and there's one more title, and I don't have time to get into detail, so we're going to cover it in the coming weeks. But we see it in Matthew chapter 1. Verses 21 through 23 says this, She will bear son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. For God so loved that he gave. His covenant love gives us Jesus. Throughout the scriptures, the people would question, who is this Jesus? Why can he preach like that? Why can he teach like that? Why can he heal like that? How dare he forgive sins? And people wondered, who is this Jesus? My question for us is, who is this Jesus? to us. Is he, is he God? Is he the anointed prophet, priest, and king? Is he the savior? Is he the son of David and therefore the rightful king and ruler? Is he the son of Abraham who will bring blessing to all the nations? Is he Emmanuel, God with us. I think that's the question we have to answer during Christmas. And my second question is this. Maybe you could relate to some of the ladies in the genealogy, their desperation, their longing, that the pain and the sorrow. Will you come to Jesus? during this Advent season, this Christmas, and receive his unconditional covenant love. See, the scriptures teach us this is love, not that we love God, 
but that he loved us and sent his son as the propitiation for our sins. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for him coming into the world to save his people from their sins. God, thank you for your love for us, for your love to us in Jesus, for your love motivating the sending of Jesus, for your love, Father and Son, to enter this world, Holy Spirit, for your love to indwell us, Jesus, for your love to die for us. I pray that um, this covenant love of God would be uh, what would, would sink into our hearts and would transform this Christmas season for us. Pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.